Testing, one, two, three. Okay. Um, here we go. So we already did that, we already did that. All right, so we're going through a ton of material. So we're going to go through Big Bang, um, a couple of other theories. We could spend a ton of time on, but we don't have that kind of time. So I'm going over three other theories very quickly. We're going to talk about nucleosynthesis, and then we're going to talk about early bombardment and a little bit of plate tectonics. Why? Because next week we're going to dive into plate tectonics. Remember, our whole goal is to talk about volcanoes because, well, they rock. Um, no, because we're going to talking about um, Mount Rainier. We're talking about why we have different style eruptions, what's causing that. And so as a result of that, we kind of have to get into plate tectonics to understand why we have volcanoes. Okay. Uh, clicky. Clicky, clicky. All right. So, again, a lot of this you already have. Please don't. Phone, go away. I'm sorry. It's on buzz, but it's buzzing. Um, we went through this, so I'm going through it quickly. Obviously, about 15 billion years ago, something happened that started and kicked off uh, what we call the Big Bang event. Everything was squished into what they call kind of like a singularity, right? And then it all started. Big Bang. What was before Big Bang? Just like I told you. Like, we don't know. What did it expand into? We don't know, right? What started it off? We don't know. And that's one of the things that I find, um, especially a lot of uh, type A personalities, the fact that we're in a science class, you want facts. I can't give them to you because they don't exist, okay? Well, I can give you facts. I can't give you an answer. There isn't one. We haven't discovered it. That's what I love about science because there's so much more to still discover and to figure out and to understand. But in some cases, it drives people crazy because it's like, why are you teaching this if you don't know the answer? Because I'm teaching you what we do know and I'm teaching you what we've discovered and how we've done so. Okay, if that makes sense. Uh, one of the biggest things that'll drive me crazy, and if you did listen to the Big Bang Time Machine, you'll know it's not an explosion. Okay, so the fact that they called it Big Bang is a horrible title. It should have been called the big expansion because what it was, instead of a giant big explosion where everything happened, it was like blowing up a balloon and it, and it expanded from a very small, um, small space. Like the whole universe is in a hot death state, right? It was small. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I put this on here because it's hypnotized. Here are the kind of big three theories, right? Inflation's the one that we're talking about, inflating kind of like a balloon. So we have the singularity and everything grew from there. And it took a lot amount of time. Remember, we're talking 15 billion years from now. Okay. Um, another theory, which uh, is kind of cool, is that there was an entire other universe get, that got sucked into a black hole and then spit us all out in, in the most simplistic way I can kind of explain it. Um, that's kind of cool. We don't know what goes into or how things escape or where things are in a black hole goes to. So to kind of think that we just got um, is, I think, kind of a cool theory. Um, another theory we have is if you think about like a slinky or an accordion, right? So we have this big stretching out phase and then we're going to have this contraction phase. Okay, so right now we're still expanding, but maybe at some point we have another uh, contraction. And then it's going to expand again and contract, expand and contract. Okay, one of the other things that I want to talk about is the definition of a theory. And the reason why is because it gets thrown around all the time. Like, well, we don't actually have to learn it because it's just a theory, right? Like, there's a difference between, like, I have a theory why you didn't finish your packet that you just turned in versus a scientific theory. Okay, so a scientific theory, it's not a hunch. It's not an idea. It's not a hypothesis. It is something that we've done a lot of tests. We have a lot of evidence. We have a lot of support. We've got a lot to back up this theory. It won't ever be a law, but we have a lot of information to back and to support it versus uh, maybe I, I, I think you guys stayed up too late like talking to your friends and didn't get your homework done. Right, so there's a difference between that. I have nothing to support that, but we have a lot of evidence to support a lot of the scientific theories that we come up with, which is how it gets the title theory. Okay, one of um, those pieces of evidence is that I told you motion of galaxies, that red shift. 
Okay, so this is the definition that you guys already have, but I want you to think back to our last unit when we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. And part of that electromagnetic spectrum is this little tiny part called visible light, right? And in that are the colors of the rainbow. Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Red are those really long wavelengths. Violet are those very short wavelengths, at least in that part of the spectrum. Okay, so what they're saying in redshift is that the light coming from these stars and these galaxies are having this extended long wavelength, showing that it's being stretched out and that it's moving further away from us. If it was coming at us, it would be blue shift and it would have a shorter wavelength, okay? Same also thing you guys have heard of the Doppler effect, or you hear cars that pass you all the time, right? That ee okay? So that higher pitch, that ee, that is the blue shift. It's coming at you with a shorter wavelength. All right, that's the longer wavelength, and it's getting stretched out. It's the same kind of thing, because it's all about waves. One of them's for light, and we're seeing it as the stretching of the universe versus sound, but it's the same concept, if that makes sense. Okay, so I kind of went back here because, like I said, I want to keep re referencing your Big Bang time machine so we could kind of watch the event unfold because the first thing that somebody asks me is like, but Adams, you're telling me everything's moving away? But when we first started watching that Big Bang time machine, like, it came towards us, right? Let's watch. Boop, boop. It's got to work. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Right? So that just tells me that you're full of baloney. Not necessarily, right? So remember we came from that singularity. That nothingness is where our current time machine is. And that's why we're seeing it come out at us. Okay, so you got to take yourself. Remember, all of this is like fiction anyway. But if we're watching it from that nothing that was there, um, then you're going to see that expansion. And that's what you're seeing originally. Perfect. Yep. We're in a pocket that our time machine's on, being able to watch something, okay, in our nothingness. Um, but as you continued watching, you're starting to see all of that now going away from us, right? It's coming to the center and it's moving away from us. And so that's kind of showing you that shift as now we're actually in. Uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation, remember, that's just the leftover energy. If you go back and we look at the time, or I mean the temperature, that first temperature we have, remember all those zeros? Right? Super, super hot. High energy. Whole lot of uh, heat going on there. We see it today. We see that remnant energy today. You hear it when you're listening to the static from those radio stations. That's how we discovered it. Okay? So that high energy and all of that, we actually can still, this is what they call the fingerprint. This is what we have to support it as far as being able to physically see those temperature changes. And then here, because I wanted to show you again, um, that's uh, its conversion into Fahrenheit. So a lot of zeros still, just something that is kind of hard to wrap your head around. Super, super, super hot. Um, then our third piece of evidence is that abundance of hydrogen and helium, okay? And this is because those lighter elements are only made from a couple protons and neutrons. And so they're the first created after the Big Bang. And what really helps is being able to Pull that down and have it stay down. <laughs> All right, so our first element, hydrogen, one proton. Okay, so it's light. It's very simple. Our next one is helium. Two protons, two neutrons. They are the simplest elements that we have. Okay, they're the first elements that we have. But before that... Right, because I had a lot of people in their observations as they were showing me, they're calling these things planets. But read your notes, okay? Quarks is the first thing to form. They're smaller than protons and electrons, if you can even fathom that. Again, a lot of this is hard to wrap your head around, I understand. But nothing else could form because it was too hot. We're still talking about these huge temperatures, okay? Next thing is we're going to get protons and neutrons. We still don't have atoms and elements. It's just those protons and neutrons floating around because it's still too hot. But look at the temperature change, 10 to the 30, 10 to the 24th. We're decreasing. 
Why are we decreasing in temperature? Well, let's think about it. If we were all to huddle in the middle of the, of the room, we're all going to die from heat, right? Because we're all right next to each other. But what's happening here is we're expanding out. So if we go from all cuddle in one area, giving heat to each other, to stepping out, then we're starting to cool off. Cooling down, and that's another reason why you're seeing that temperature drop. After our protons and neutrons are forming, we're going to see those electrons forming. Okay, we still don't have elements. These things are just whizzing around. Why? But now look at the temperature change. Drastic change before those electrons formed. Okay, now we're only talking about 100,000 billion Kelvin versus 10 to the 21, right? Next thing we see, though, 10, uh, 10,000 billion, right? So now we're looking at it's cooling down enough for you to actually start getting those nuclei. To get the further elements, we have to go into the birth of the stars, okay? That's your nucleosynthesis. But basically now we've kind of gone through the beginning of Big Bang to that far and a little bit of the evidence that we've seen. Um, from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing on your guys' uh, models from the last unit, you know quite a bit about the life cycles of stars. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it then because uh, we don't need to. We've got the stars and the galaxies forming. If you notice here, we're starting to finally get out of seconds and we're talking about years. We're in years now. Uh, we know that the Earth and the solar system, I'm also putting more content on here, and that's for everything else we've already done with the time machine. If you go back and do your notes, I wanted this on here because I'm talking really, really fast, and there's no way you take notes if you wanted them. Okay, so today uh, we're allowed to go backwards to determine how everything was created and formed. Plus, um, we can go into the universe for clues on how stars and planets are currently being formed. So we are seeing them currently being formed and then we can take that information and realize that if it's happening now, it had to have happened before. And that's how we kind of make those connections. Um, we've discovered now over 200 planets orbiting other stars. Um, the process that created our solar system have also created a ton of other solar systems. Uh, there's no way for us to actually even know. Um, the nebular hypothesis is kind of how we uh, are going for understanding how it got created. We start with this huge gas of a cloud or a gas cloud that starts to kind of form together. And as it does, uh, there's more of a turbulence on the outside of the cloud. And it starts collecting all of this debris and this matter. Okay, so we're, we have elements now out there. And as it does, it's kind of colliding with others. Right. And if you take like a little piece of silly putty or let's say Play-Doh and you take it from here and then you take it from here and you take it from here and you take it from here, you're starting to get a bigger and bigger and bigger piece of that Play-Doh. Right. That's kind of what they're saying here. You're adding more and more to it, which means that your little matter that might have started this big is going to start getting bigger and bigger because as you get more of these coming together. Um, we are seeing again from the Hubble telescope, we're actually seeing this happen. Uh, stars are emerging from these dense, compact pockets of interstellar gas, um, basically called these evaporating gas or <laughs> globules, right? So we're, again, this is not something that we're necessarily theorizing. We are making these observations. Uh, the grand, uh, gravitational attraction. So when you start having this happen and it gets big enough, um, then it's going to start having that gravity, okay? That gravity is going to start uh, contracting it and it's going to start rotating. As that happens, then more and more matter is going to start getting sucked into that center, okay? As it starts to do that, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to get what we call the protostar. That's the beginning of your um, star process, okay? And it's going to... Hello. So at this point, you're starting to get that the stars and the galaxies have formed, right? So we're seeing that all of this debris is coming together together. They're starting to rotate. We're starting to get that these things are forming. And now that's taken us about 700 billion years or million years. Right? Um, then we go into as we have the star, we're going to go through the star life cycle. As it goes through its life cycle, different stars based on their size and based on their age are going to give us different elements. And you can kind of tell just by looking at the periodic table. Like the, the smaller ones are going to give you the lighter elements. The heavier ones are going to give you some of the um, bigger elements. 
and you go through and you can kind of see this starting. Uh, the heavier elements started about 900 million years ago, okay? And look at the temperature. We're at 500 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin. So huge decrease from where we were at before. This is basically, again, that life cycle. I made you guys write this down. Okay, so you got hydrogen and helium at the beginning of the lives of your average and massive star. And then as you go to your red giants and your super red giants, depending on, you're going to have those heavier elements all the way until you get... We will never, ever, ever have our sun go into a supernova because he's an average star. He's not a massive star. So instead, he'll do the planetary nebula where things just kind of go off, okay? I also put this together, too, because if you don't like pictures, some of you like graphs and tables. Um, our sun, again, right now is enough uh, matter and came together, was doing hydrogen and helium into helium. Again, you guys know this because that was part of the last unit that you guys were telling me all about. Okay, as we're moving now, um, I can't already talk about that. Uh, we start talking about Earth now. Okay, so we have at this point we have gone from the singularity. We have gone through a ton of um, matter forming. We've gone through temperature changes. We've gone through millions and millions of time. Now we get to kind of talk about our Earth. It was formed kind of from that same process of things clumping together and clumping together and clumping together and clumping together. Okay, we've got Earth estimated at 4.5 billion years old. Um, and we have meteorites that kind of give us that information. Um, debris left over from the formation of our solar system. We can date these using radioactive um, isotopes, which as we get further on into chemistry, we can kind of talk about half-lives and how we can calculate how old something eventually was based on what element it's formed. But I wanted to get into this whole early Earth bombardment, okay? Because this is where it's kind of cool. We're getting bombarded by all these asteroids and meteorites. Um, for the first half a billion years of existence, the surface of the Earth was just repeatedly getting pulverized um, by these comets of all shapes and sizes. One of these actually uh, formed the moon, and they think it was probably about the size of Mars that collided with us. And as a result, like all of this debris um, started circulating around the Earth. And then as that continued, it started to, again, kind of coalesce, come together, kind of that squashing uh, uh, Plato theory until it started circulating and orbiting because it got caught up in Earth's gravity. gravity. Um, some of the material stayed in space, uh, and then the other continued to bombard the Earth. Okay, and as those continued to bombard, it started to heat up the Earth. If you think about it this way, when you get cold, right, your hands are freezing. What's the first thing you're going to do? Right? And what are you doing? You're creating friction, right? And that friction is heating up your hands. Now imagine all of these comets and stuff hitting the Earth. They're obviously coming at high speeds. That high speed, that energy's got to go somewhere, and so then it's radiating out in the form of heat. Make sense? I mean, it's a ton of speed, a ton of that energy. Energy is not created nor destroyed. It's got to do something. It can change into another form of energy, creating more of a thermal energy. Um, compression, right? As all of this is kind of coming together and getting compressed, a lot of you guys learned about metamorphic rocks. Right, And you learn that kind of as you get deeper in the earth, it gets hotter. And that's because of all of the overlying rocks kind of squishing it. Same thing of turning carbon into a diamond, the synthetic diamonds. Right, So they take carbon, or you could take coal, and you put it under enough heat and pressure, and it turns into a diamond, a synthetic diamond. That's where they come from. That compression, okay, uh, that kind of pressure added also is going to uh, get where you get that heat from. And then radioactive elements, uranium, potassium, thorium. Does anybody have a, a little bit of petrified wood? Yeah, I got a ton, right? Um, slightly radioactive, right? And the reason why is because of um, it's, it's changing forms in the radioactive isotopes. Not that you have to worry about it. You'll be fine. Um, so the core, again, I know I'm going super fast, guys. I'm trying. Keep an eye 54. Okay. Okay. Um, after about 100 years of its initial growth, the temperatures, I put them in miles because we don't normally talk about kilometers, about 245 to 490 miles below the surface started melting iron. 
That's huge. Those are those heavier elements. Where did we get those from? Those are from those uh, supernova, right? So these events of these other stars and stuff creating finally are getting uh, caught up in other comets and other debris. And as a result, they're coming to Earth. Uh, this is called global chemical differential. Um, the heavier elements are denser. So if it's heavier, it's going to sink. Lighter things float, right? That's something that everybody can wrap their head around. This is the same thing. Those heavier elements, again, if you look at where iron is compared to hydrogen, right, those ones are sinking. And that's why we find those heavier elements in the Earth's core. And yet the crust and everything that we're standing on is those lighter elements of silicon. You're talking about silicon, who is right here, versus iron, which is way down here. Okay, so those heavier elements are getting dropped down. They're getting pulled down because they're denser. And so they're getting caught up in that core and it's melting. Why? Because of all of that compression. All of that's starting to heat it up and it's melting. Um, yeah. Moving on. Um, so about 4.3 billion years ago, kind of is when it started and the Earth started to develop that inner core, outer core, the mantle crust. Those are the layers that you've heard of. Those are the things that you're comfortable with. Right? All of those heavier elements you're going to find again down in that deeper core. Um, here it kind of gives you some more of those uh, depths in kilometers. Um, I have it a little bit more here too. I'm going to go into a little bit more. And the reason why is because again, next week we're talking about plate tectonics. We have to understand how that works. So if we look at again our inner core, that's that inner uh, most, it's solid. Okay, our outer core is a liquidy. Um, shell around it. Uh, this mantle, okay, is is a little bit. Um, it's a lot hotter, but it's also a little bit of mixture. And then your asphenosphere, silly putty. Literally, that's the best way to describe it. Y'all played with silly putty, and you put it on there, and you pull up the comics, right? And it just oozes. That's what the asphenosphere is on. Now, if you put something like really heavy on it, what's going to happen is that it's going to slide around. And that's basically where we get plate tectonics from. You've got this heavy rock sitting on top, holding all of us and our mountains and everything else. And you're putting it on something that's slippery and not very solid. And so as a result, we get these plates that start moving around the earth. Um, and then the hydrosphere is your like water and then your atmosphere. Oop, wrong way. Oop, that way. Okay, so as far as the chemical composition, Again, those heavier elements are sinking, those lighter elements are rising. So those continents are formed from the magma that's coming up from the mantle. And so that's why we still see that from here. Um, but like a lot of your beach sediment, a lot, uh, you see a lot of quartz more than you see iron, right? Think about how often you see quartz just in sand. Like quartz is abundant. Quartz is made up of silicon. That's mostly what it is. And the reason why it's so abundant is again, because it's light. You're not going to find a lot of iron just laying around on your beaches, right? Um, but the oceans and the atmosphere, that's that fluid, uh, fluid and gas from those outer layers believed to have been created by the outgassing. Where, what's outgassing? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Let's, Because we're going to start talking about volcanoes because they are awesome. You take your bottle of your soda and you shake it up and it's creating all that gas. We all know it's going to explode, right? Or even your can. Why? Because as you're doing that, you're creating more gases in there, right? So these gases are still being emitted as they're deep in the core. And then as we finally have those volcanic eruptions, we're getting more gases being emitted. <coughs> um, and that's called this volatile transfer. And that's kind of where we start getting an atmosphere. Our early atmosphere is totally lethal for us. And that is why we don't have life on it at the, that time. Because um, mostly we have a lot of hydrogen and helium, but it's light. There's nothing that we can do to hold it. So it's just escaping. But as we continue, um, uh, and that's why we have basically no hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere now. But as things continue with these volcanic eruptions and outgassing, you're going to get a lot more of uh, different types of gases, which you're going to see sound familiar. Like, what do we get today from a volcanic eruption? We get a lot of water vapor sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, ammonia, and methane. But if you look, uh, note the oxygen isn't being created. And that's why we can't live here yet. 
these, this is what our atmosphere is made up of. And there are not a whole lot of living things here that can survive this, us included. Like we'd put one foot out there and we'd be done. Okay, so we still don't have life on Earth yet. Um, it's also hypothesized that that water vapor escaping from the interior of the Earth um, is coming from those volcanic eruptions helped create some of our oceans. But again, we're talking that hundreds of millions of years. But that's not the only theory that we have saying that we had water here on Earth. The other one was saying that if you think of what a comet is, it's basically a really dirty snowball. Okay? And we're being bombarded by these things. And we're really hot. Right? So this constant bombardment and this outgassing of volcanic activity um, and that's melting all of these comets and we're getting all of this other material and all of this stuff is happening, we start developing our oceans. Okay, the earliest evidence of surface water dates back to 3.8 uh, billion years ago. So we've talked from 15 billion years, now we're only in 3.8 billion years, which is still unfathomable. We've been talking on this lecture for 27 minutes and 32 seconds and half of you are already asleep. Can you imagine billions of years when you can't even stay awake for 27 minutes and 32 seconds, right? Like this is time that we can't fathom and it's hard to wrap our heads around it because it just seems like too fantastical. Um, but after 3.5 billion years, the earth, uh, we start getting more of that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Methane, water vapor, uh, again, still poisonous, has almost no oxygen. Because remember, right now, our oxygen is at about 21%. These extensive oceans and seas actually now have salt water, which contained a lot of dissolved elements, such as iron. But the most important thing about 3.5 billion years ago is that now we have life. We have bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. This is what you'll learn more about next year when you guys take biology. But photosynthetic, right? So we just talked about photons, photons being light. Synthetic, making things. We talked about nuclear synthesis, and we know nuclear or synthesis means putting things together. Photosynthetic bacteria is going to take that light and that carbon dioxide, just like photosynthesis, and it's going to turn it into oxygen. Those first bacteria is what basically paved the way for life to be habitable here on Earth. We owe them a round of applause. Um, finally then, at 2.5 billion years ago, the continents are being formed. It's cooling. It's being able to be um, cold enough to, for, for uh, rocks to be on there. Because before, all we had were seas. But now at 2.5 billion years, we're getting our continents forming. Remember, they're lighter, so they're able to float more to the top. And the crest at the bottom of those oceanics are a lot uh, denser, so they're heavier. The problem that we still have, and I can't believe I did it all time again, is that um, we still don't know how plate tectonics began. Right? So just like we don't know how the Big Bang began, we don't know what triggered plate tectonics to actually begin and move. And we're going to talk about that a lot more next week as we get into We're going to do a cool Oreo lab. We're going to talk about the different plate boundaries and stuff like that. Um, but I'm going to stop this now. That is all I had for you today because I was rushing to get through it. Here's what, real quick, I see I'm already losing you guys. Here's what I promised I would tell you, one more second, I would tell you what you're responsible for. What do you need to know? Because that's ultimately all you care about, right? Um, you got to know those three pieces of evidence to support Big Bang, which I've given you. Hopefully now I've explained them a little bit with some background so that you understand what those three pieces of evidence are and how they support Big Bang. Uh, nuclear synthesis. You need to be able to understand how elements are created and what elements were created. Okay? As far as early bombardment goes, you got to understand we got bombarded like pretty intense. And a reason for that is uh, how our earth actually became habitable. We were able to get a core. We were able to start having that molten surface, which then led to um, water, oceans, which then led to plate tectonics in our asthenosphere and all of that, because all of that's going to lead us to um, our, our volcanoes. Again, talking volcanoes so we can talk about chemistry 
And then our ultimate engineering feat is to figure out um, how to save people who live under a volcano like the town of Warning. Okay, so he's been very patient, and then I'll get to you.